This episode is brought to you by Brilliant. I heard some scientists were surprised when they discovered a particle that moves faster than the speed of light. I guess they just didn't see it coming. We occasionally talk about what faster light or FTL travel or communication might imply for exploring the universe, but mostly on this show, unlike virtually every science fiction setting, we take the stance that light speed is a hard limit, something you can't even reach with a spaceship, let alone exceed. Folks often ask me to discuss why this is the case or what it would mean if it weren't, and if we would do some episodes on it. In point of fact, we did. Our FTL series was one of our first on the show, and I rarely mention them because production-wise they are all the episodes and show it, and folks have been asking for it to be replaced or expanded on for a long while now, and we'll go ahead and do that, but I thought we'd reopen the topic by discussing why it's problematic to reach or exceed light speed, and overviewing some of the suggested workarounds and what they require of reality. As an example, and one we'll get to in more detail later today, most versions of warp drives or wormholes require negative matter or negative energy to operate, that's baked into the math and theories for them, and we have no evidence for existence of such matter. That's what we'll be looking at in our summary for today, and our effective prologue for the reboot of that FTL series, the basics of why FTL isn't thought to be allowed under known physics, and the various ways proposed FTL methods might exist if that understanding is incomplete, or flawed, or we can find some cheat code to reality. And while I mostly mean cheating reality in the context of us not really understanding the rules of our universe, or finding exploitable loopholes, or wormholes, it is worth remembering that all we study are the natural laws of this universe, we don't know where those laws come from or if there is some additional layers of reality. Indeed concepts like hyperspace usually imply a congruent universe with different physical laws. But we also don't know that we can't change our own universe's laws. Same as a video game or simulation has parameters in it a programmer can alter, we might be able to do that to our reality, increasing the speed of light for instance. Indeed we can't even say conclusively if we are in a simulation or not. Short of a program or simulator choosing to inform you that you live in a simulated reality, you can never prove you are or are not in one. As we often say on this show, the better question isn't if this is all real or not, but if it even matters, and if you live in some simulation or equivalent, being able to tamper with the code locally or globally, or universally, is potentially very handy and a way to travel fast. Now that simulation notion is of more than tangential interest to us today, because we need to ask why there is a maximum speed, the speed of light, and the first thing to understand about that is that it is somewhat misnamed the maximum speed of information would be more appropriate. Light was the first thing traveling at that speed that we found, or Robo having demonstrated with the moons of Jupiter in 1676, almost 350 years ago, but we also believe any massless particle moves at this speed, such as the graviton, gluon, or neutrino. Except the neutrino turned out to have a tiny amount of mass and be moving just the tiniest fraction slower than light, and indeed we tend to just assume those other three, photons, gluons, and gravitons, have no mass, but they could each have a tiny amount of it. It is not really possible to prove something has zero mass, any more than that something is infinite in scope, or for that matter identical to something else, or basically equal to one. Zero, one, and infinity are all philosophically and scientifically tricky numbers, we can't actually prove two protons or two neutrons have exactly identical mass to each other, that any proton has exactly one proton mass, we just assume that it is probably so, and have demonstrated that any variance is either very tiny or very rare. If photons have mass, even a tiny bit of it, then they could not be moving at the speed of light, rather they'd move just a tiny amount under that. Though of course they would be moving at the speed of light since they are light particles, but as I said, the name's a touch misleading as it's really the fastest speed that information or cause and effect can occur at. If photons turned out to have a little rest mass, then they would be moving just a little slower than that, but they'd still be moving at light speed since that's how we measure or approximate that speed in the first place. Again, not an ideal name. We'll never get it renamed, but I like to think of it as the speed of cause and effect better than the speed of light, not just because it's more conceptually accurate, but because it's often easier for folks to believe in the idea of it as a maximum speed. Realizing the speed limit is a maximum rate that cause and effect can happen at, the speed of causality, makes it feel a lot less arbitrary and hard to get around than simply the speed light moves. 
The second big thing to understand about the speed of light, or speed of causality, is that it's not even vaguely a limit on how fast objects can move away from each other. Quite a few objects move faster than the speed of light, indeed very nearly all the Universe does. Wait, say what? Yeah, most of the Universe is moving away from us faster than the speed of light. We've known about that nearly as long as we've known about Einstein's theories of special and general relativity. This is Hubble expansion, and we believe it's caused by little pockets of space simply randomly appearing from nothing all over the Universe, probably little Planck length wide ones, as small to an atom as an atom is to a planet, simply emerging here and there, probably many have emerged right inside you and me, and a net effect is the Universe gains in volume as this proceeds. Since this appears to be universal and random, then at any given distance you would expect to have about a meter of new space appearing between you and that point in a given second. That means if you were moving a meter per second, a casual walking speed, you would never reach that other object as new space would appear between you and it as fast as you walked it. The distance is about 15 parsecs or 46 light years, so it's no distance you're walking anyway, but at double that distance it would be moving away twice as fast, 2 meters per second, faster than you could walk so you'd be getting further away even if you were walking toward it constantly. With time it would be moving ever faster and faster away as that distance increased and was more space for random new space to emerge between you and it. Well the speed of light is 300 million meters per second, so before you even get to 14 billion light years from Earth you've got objects moving away from us so fast that light leaving them or us can't cover that new distance as fast as being added. Light that left them or us a long while back when we were closing will arrive eventually, redshifted, but no signal sent by them today or us to them will ever get heard, and you'll never get a spaceship there because it can't travel at light speed or faster. As this space grows and expands, things currently only a billion light years away from us will get so far away and so fastly moving away that they will disappear from our observable universe and vice versa. Indeed only maybe the 20 or 30 closest galaxies to us, out of many billions, would not eventually disappear this way, and most of the things we can see with our most powerful telescopes are already beyond this speed, no light emitted by them today will ever reach us again. Which in my experience is a statement that either infuriates or frustrates most folks, didn't you just say the vast majority of the Universe is moving away from us faster than light, and now you are saying nothing can move faster than light, that's nonsensical. And yes it is, because it's an abridged statement really. Like I said there's all sorts of objects that move faster than the speed of light. What can't move faster than that is cause and effect, events can't transpire faster than that speed. Now you've probably seen Einstein's equations before, E equals mc squared plus the Lorentz equation and so on, and I can put those up on the screen but I'm not very interested in discussing those today. Frankly I'm not sure it's very helpful, especially for the topic of FTL to show how math says you can't exceed light speed. The math says what it says but it's describing a concept, and the concept there is that objects made of energy, be that pure mass energy or other types, experience time, and thus can experience cause and effect. Again this is all about cause and effect, an object you look at that has all of its energy, from your perspective, invested as mass energy, which is to say a big rock sitting next to you, experiences the maximum passage of time. Alternatively objects that are moving have some of their total energy involved in that motion, and as a result are experiencing less time, at least from your perspective, and of course they'd see time moving a bit slower for you if they are watching you while you moved apart. All energy an object has is only countable in the context of some other object, or relative to it, the energy object A has relative to object B. For the moment don't worry about why this is the case, just absorb that energy comes in a lot of forms and only what we call mass is really experiencing time. Potential energy, like what you have when high above something massive like our planet, also slows time, and thus time slows near black holes. Energy and time are inextricably linked, and indeed are complementary variables in quantum mechanics and the uncertainty principle, same as position and momentum are to each other. The more precisely you know something's position, the less precisely you can know its momentum, and so too, the more precisely you know how much energy something has, the less precise you can be about how much time is passing for it, and vice versa. This is at a more core and metaphysical level what is happening, things cannot experience cause and effect with some other object without experiencing time, and the larger a portion of an object's energy relative to another object is in things other than mass, like energy of motion or gravity, the slower that passage of time or cause and effect between them is happening. 
indeed something with only non-mass energy, like a photon is believed to be, experiences no time whatsoever. That photon is less some spherical blob-like particle moving through space, and more like a very long line of energy stretched between two events, its creation at a given time and place, and its absorption or scattering at some later time and place. It itself has no internal action or events going on during this, it's a stretched packet of energy, potentially billions of light years long, and if you want to think of this as how redshift of light works, that long redshifted ones are particularly stretched out and weak, then that is a bit oversimplified but maybe easier to conceptually understand. For everything with mass, then from any given observer, that object's total energy is going to be at most 100% mass, or maximum time experience between you and it. Now in practice, even an object stationary to you, like the screen you are watching this episode on, has some other energies besides mass from your perspective. It has heat energy, the random motion of particles it's made of, and it's got some gravitational potential energy with you, you both pull on each other just a little bit, but for you and me and objects we interact with, these other energies generally make up far less than a percent of the total energy that object has relative to us. Key word there, relative to us because its mass might be the same whether it's sitting next to me or moving away from me, but that motion takes energy and it's not energy that object has relative to something glued to it, or in the eyes of a passing observer. Those energies though are slowing time in terms of you interacting with that object, and they can get to be very significant outside our daily lives here on Earth. Again, most objects in this universe are moving away from us and each other faster than light. So we can't experience any time with them at all, no cause and effect exchanges. Things moving very fast relative to us, like some spaceship flying by or things with a lot of mass, like a star or a black hole, have so much non-mass energy relative to us that their cause and effect exchanges between us and them are much slower. Weird concept, but essentially mass is that thing which experiences time and interactions, and the bigger the ratio of it to other energies involved, the faster those interactions occur. Now an object with mass must always be able to experience some time, since no matter how fast it's going relative to you, it still has mass, and this is why you can never get to that maximum speed, or rather why you can never experience zero time passage, because no matter how much energy I dump into an object to move it faster, some portion of it is still going to be mass, and experience time, even if it's only one part in a million, what we call ultra-relativistic, and we do that ratio and more in laboratories for particles where they are genuinely experiencing time millions of times slower than a nearby clock would read. Now why is this speed, this speed of light or speed of causality, 300 million meters per second? We don't know. We don't know why the amount of gravitational force a kilogram of mass exerts at 1 meter's distance is 67 piconewtons, not say 1 newton, and there may be universes where it's higher and there may be some way to alter the laws of reality to make it be 1 newton. There may be places where light speed is higher or lower, and maybe we can change that speed of causality, or change how much force a kilogram of matter exerts gravitationally, but this is the kind of change we're talking about when we talk about getting around light speed. It's not a wall to punch through, it's a barrier the way 2 plus 2 equals 4 and making it equal 5 requires breaking some barrier. It's not some speed limit for matter or energy in that sort of sense. Just phrasing it that way predisposes us to view it as some barrier to break. Folks don't really sit around and debate whether or not we can make a kilogram of matter make more gravity or less, but it's the same sort of fundamental reality change. This is the critical notion though. We don't care about equations beyond them letting us figure out the specific rates things are going at, what we care about is that things going on, genuine events involving cause and effect, can only occur at certain rates. Some galaxy flying away from us at twice light speed is no longer interacting with us, there is no cause and effect possible between us. So too, we can make objects move faster than light, they just cannot be capable of relaying information or causing and affecting things faster than light speed. We've got two easy examples. I can take a very powerful laser pointer and point it at Mars, several light minutes away, and the beam will arrive there several light minutes later. I can now whip that beam around very quickly so that it moved over the surface of Mars faster than light, but that dot of light won't actually move to reflect me swiveling around in my hand until several minutes later, and if I use that dot to write a letter or a high powered version to carve my name into Mars' surface, I am conveying information but it still won't happen there for several minutes. I can move that dot at arbitrarily high speeds and write information or communicate information, but it is delayed. 
I'm the cause of that beam moving, and it has an effect when it arrives, and the dot itself can move faster than light, but all those effects I cause won't happen until several minutes pass. Now we have objects called pulsars that'll give you off light and radiation same as any star, but they are dead stars emitting in more of one set of directions than another, and they are spinning very fast, seconds or fractions of seconds, not a day like on Earth or around a month for our Sun. So this caused a strobing effect akin to if you spun a flashlight on a table and looked at the wall as the beam went by. This happens with pulsars on nebulae, giant gas clouds often near pulsars, and it would be another example of a superluminal effect, as the beam is whipping through that nebula in a circle, maybe once a second, while that cloud of gas it's illuminating might be a light year away. It's faster than light, but no cause and effect is occurring faster than light. You can do this exact same effect with something emitting shadows rather than a light beam too, and unlike light beams with a continuous beam of energy packets, a shadow is composed of nothing at all, but it is still an object. Or is it? It contains no matter or energy after all. This isn't a semantic point because we can call a shadow intangible and thus not a real object, but that's not the same as saying it has no mass or energy. After all, a radio beam is pretty intangible to us too. We probably do not want the defining line between real and unreal, tangible and intangible, concrete or abstract, each all specifically hinging on if something contains mass or energy. Now it's doubly important because our equations that say how fast something is going start giving different answers if we stick negative or imaginary numbers into them. As I said we don't want to focus on the equations for relativity because they are not driving the events or rules, they are just the constructs we use for calculating the effects, no more real than a shadow. However it is a good place to introduce the concept of negative matter or negative energy. We will reserve a deep dive for another day, but in general our FTL methods for warp drives or wormholes rely on the notion that the square root of negative one, an imaginary number, can exist, or that things can have negative masses. This is anything but a given. We hear things like negative charge or antimatter and shrug and say something could presumably have negative mass too, but there is no such thing as negative charge. Electrical charge is just a left and right, heads and tails sort of quantity, and we choose to assign that a numerical value as positive and negative. It implies genuine negativity no more than a battery for storing electricity contains cannons, which is where we got the term battery, Benjamin Franklin thought it looked like a battery of weapons, and borrowed a lot of other artillery terms for electricity including charge. The names do not imply protons or electrons contain artillery units, or that charge actually is positive or negative, it's just opposites, and antimatter is matter with an opposite or mere quality too. We say matter and antimatter annihilate, but they don't actually disappear. Merging two bits of matter and antimatter just makes them change into something else, most typically a pair of powerful photons. That energy doesn't cease to exist and antimatter does not contain negative energy. But we've got notions for things like negative, opposite, mirror reflection, shadows, and so on, so the idea of negative mass or imaginary seems viable. If you put that into the Lorentz equation though you get values for speeds higher than light. This is cheat one for FTL, we have negative and imaginary numbers in mathematics, and if we stuff them into the equations we can get negative flows of time, events happening after their cause for instance, or matter that pushes other matter away from it by negative gravity, or which cause space-time to expand rather than contract, as dense amounts of normal matter do, or dense amounts of energy also do. Now we may well find things with those properties, matter that emits gravitational push instead of pull, and that might permit a stable wormhole as we'll detail in the future, but fundamentally it's a math trick. We have not one single particle of negative matter nor should we assume it exists. Mass is a trait that can be measured in quantity, like cookies. A negative cookie is not a real thing. If I bake cookies and put them into a cookie jar, I cannot be charged with stealing negative cookies from that cookie jar. It's nonsensical physically, and it doesn't matter if it's mathematically possible. Assuming mass comes in negative form simply because we can conceive of a negative number is no more valid than assuming the existence of negative cookies, or assuming that you can have a negative speed. You don't, you have a speed relative to some other object. We can phrase that as negative to imply it's getting closer to you, which would be a negative speed away, but it doesn't mean that object has negative momentum, any more than owing your friend $20 implies the existence of a negative $20 bill, or negative goods. Similarly an object's kinetic energy is based on the square of its speed or velocity, it cannot be a negative number. All numbers, positive or negative, yield a positive number as their square. 
except that the square of an imaginary number is negative, so something with imaginary speed can have a negative kinetic energy. Normally things only have negative values relative to something else, not in absolute terms. I'm not sure what an imaginary speed would mean in real physical terms, presumably going faster at it produces energy rather than taking more energy to speed up, and going too fast can get you imaginary speeding tickets. And Descartes named imaginary numbers that, imaginary, for a reason, they are not real, they are just useful mathematically. Of course it depends on what we mean by real I suppose. We shouldn't assume that stuffing numbers into an equation can have a real world result, like violating light speed by using imaginary speed or negative masses, but real is discussing our known universe. There could be universes where you do have mass that pushes other mass away, rather than attracting it, or where pushing on something makes it fly towards you, not away. You could have universes with no mass or energy in favor of some other thing. We could also have these in our universe and just not know of it yet. Anyway that's the basic notion of a warp drive though there are many flavors. You can crunch space-time down with a lot of mass or energy in one spot, and a negative version of that should do the reverse, expand space-time. If you can crunch space-time down ahead of you, while expanding it behind you, this offers a way to move an object in a given direction and one that's not using classic motion and energy in a way that's constrained by relativity. No violation of cause and effect here, any more than faster light expansion between distant galaxies causes it. This also offers a non-FTL version called the Bias Drive, which uses a glob of negative matter and a glob of regular matter to create a non-uniform field of gravity, kind of like an electric dipole, to cause a spaceship attached to them to fall in one direction as a means of propulsion. It's an example of how negative mass is still insanely valuable even if it didn't permit FTL. Negative matter is also potentially handy for creating the throats of wormholes, which is basically creating a big black hole with a jamming a ring of negative matter into it to permit travel to a singularity in the middle without being crushed or torn apart, and presumably out the other side into elsewhere in this universe, or some other universe. As already mentioned there's another option for FTL, you cheat the game by playing it elsewhere, some place congruent to our own universe, that was either smaller or had a faster speed limit, you jump there, move, then jump back here. This is generally the notion of hyperspace. This works just fine if such places exist, and if there's a way to travel to them and back, and if they actually had any congruency to our own universe. We have not a single bit of evidence backing any one of those three being true, but not opposed either to be fair. Tachyons are another concept for unreal matter. They were really popular in science fiction in the 1980s and 1990s and have largely disappeared in favor of quantum entanglement as a sci-fi go-to method of realistic FTL, so we'll discuss those two options before closing out for the day. Tachyons cheat reality by being a particle that exists on the other side of the light speed barrier. They don't have negative mass, they have imaginary mass, and not so much a specific particle as a type, akin to antimatter mirror reflections of regular matter, or matter with negative mass. Tachyonic matter is particles with imaginary mass, in this context we'll sometimes call matter with real mass tardionic matter, it moves slow or is tardy, and matter with no mass like photons, luxons, or luxonic matter, lux meaning light. Tachyons move faster than light and move backward in time because imaginary quantities, when squared, are negative numbers. It doesn't have to be mass incidentally, imaginary speeds or imaginary distance or other imaginary quantities, again where imaginary means the square root of a negative number, can offer FTO options, mathematically anyway. Imaginary time, as a second temporal dimension, much like we have three physical dimensions, has also been a popular topic at times. That's the math basis for the answer and again just because it works in math does not mean it does in reality, though I should note we have some reason to think there are imaginary mass fields, the Higgs boson is suspected of being imaginary mass when it's in its uncondensed form, and it's a good reminder that what we tend to think of as reality at the macroscopic human scale doesn't seem to match up too well with what goes on at the quantum scale. Which leads us into quantum entanglement. That was the topic for the entirety of our first original episode of the FTL series, way way back, and frankly that one relatively short episode still wasn't enough time to discuss the topic properly so we'll probably give it its own longer episode in this new series, but to abridge it even more for today, quantum entanglement has become the new go-to method for realistic sci-fi FTL because something does seem to happen faster than light there, what Einstein famously called spooky action at a distance. Quantum entanglement is centered on two or more particles being entangled to each other. This is a temporary condition and would include cases of matter creation, 
where a particle and its antiparticle are made by some collision or emission, what we call pale production. Entanglement is usually referring to their spin states, which would have to be opposite in this case. I like to explain entanglement and spooky action at distance using coins as an example, so we'll just say in all pale production case of entanglement, one comes out heads and the other is tails. Let's imagine an electron and its antiparticle, the positron, being created, and one has heads and the other tails, but this is an example like with Schrodinger's cat of quantum, whereas both particles are flying away, they are simultaneously heads and tails, and it's only when we measure one we force it to be either heads or tails. We can't control which it comes out as, it either comes out as heads or tails, and its twin will be the reverse, and will be so instantly or as close to it as we can tell, even if separated by light years. This sounds like a really neat and easy way to send information, or matter, faster than light, since the effect seems to happen this way, but unfortunately it is not. First of all, measuring an entangled particle breaks that entanglement afterwards. You measure a particle, its heads, its partner is now known to be tails, and after this they aren't really entangled anymore. Me flipping that coin from heads to tails isn't making its former partner flip, and thus you can't have two boxes of entangled matter light years apart acting as some sort of telegraph machine. There's a lot more to how entanglement and spooky action happens, I'm oversimplifying, and whether or not spooky action is happening that way depends on which interpretation of quantum you're using, but at its core you can't use it to send information, to have a cause and effect faster than light other than the other particle is going to a random but opposite state. As another conceptual example of this, if I send out two letters, one saying this letter is printed in red ink and is one of a pair, the other printed in green, then the person who opens that letter up, either one, instantly knows the content of the other letter too, that it's red or green, even if that letter is 50 million light years away when opened. The two are entangled, but we can't use this to send information faster than light. The difference here is that the two letters would be quantum objects flickering back and forth between red and green ink until I opened it and determined it was red or green on mine. Again that's oversimplified and we'll examine the concept of quantum entanglement for FTL and for some other handy uses some other time, as we will with the others, and we will try to ask for each case what the real world consequences and uses would be too, like how you might lay out a wormhole network for a galactic empire in future episodes. For today we're trying to explain why, even though FTL is ubiquitous in science fiction, it tends to be viewed much more pessimistically as a future option in science itself. FTL tends to be synonymous with time travel and paradoxes, again exactly because it's not really faster than light, it's faster than causality, and when causes are not preceding effects, you get time getting weird and paradoxes. My last two examples of why FTL probably isn't possible are intuitive rather than scientific. First, for time travel, think of all the time travel episodes, shows, films, and books you've encountered, and how full of hand waves and plot holes they tend to be when you ponder them. Ask if maybe that's because time is essentially pointing in the direction of effect following cause, so if you're trying to move them the other way or twist them around, you inevitably get something which doesn't make sense. On the FTL front alone, I appeal to the Fermi Paradox, our big question of where all the aliens are in this huge and ancient universe. They don't seem to be around, and that's hard enough to explain with concepts like rare conditions and great filters when a potential civilization needs to have emerged before us and relatively near us. If they can move faster than light, they could have visited or colonized their own galaxy even if their origin point was 10 billion light years away, or more, beyond the edge of our observable universe, and this massively increases the value of space they could originate from and requires far more improbabilities in evolution to intelligence and technology than a slower than light universe does. FTL only exacerbates the Fermi Paradox, and when you throw in time travel, which is generally connected to most FTL options anyway, then it's not about if we evolve first in our area of the galaxy anymore, you have to contemplate encountering civilizations that originate from planets that haven't even formed yet in regions of the Universe light from us has never reached and never will. Folks are often sad to think this staple of science fiction might be impossible, they feel it denies us the stars, and so many of our episodes on this show are about showing how we can reach them anyway, even slower than light but we should also keep in mind that there's a good chance that the only reason we are even around to contemplate the option is that FTL is impossible, and no aliens ever figured it out and colonized our world before we had a chance to exist. So maybe this limitation is something we should be grateful for instead. 
So we were talking about the speed of light today, in our last episode we discussed more of the nature and metaphysics of how this limit works, and if you would like to improve your understanding of relativity, I would recommend Brilliant's course on classical mechanics and a look at Einstein's theory of relativity. I remember when I first started studying special relativity in college and how counterintuitive it all was for me back then, so I can tell you firsthand that yes, it does eventually make sense once you work with it, and that the best way to achieve that understanding is hands-on problem solving with it. Our longtime show sponsor Brilliant is a website and app built off this very principle. You learn best while doing and solving in real time, not by long lectures or memorizing formulas and facts. With Brilliant, you can jump right into solving problems and be coached bit by bit until, before you even realize it, you learned a new subject in STEM. And if you do get stuck or make a mistake, you can read the explanations to find out more and learn at your own pace. Brilliant has something for everybody, whether you want to start with the basics of math, science, and computer science, or try any of their many excellent daily challenges, with combined with a cup of coffee is one of my favorite ways to get my brain jump started for the day. If you'd like to join me and a community of 8 million learners and educators today, click the link in the episode description below or visit brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur. So that will wrap us up for today, but we're only getting started for July, with four more Thursdays to go. But we also have our usual mid-month Sci-Fi Sunday and our end-of-the-month livestream Q&A, and we'll also be teaming up this month with Rudyard of What If Art Hissed for a collaboration episode looking at the geopolitics of space colonization. Next Thursday we'll also be continuing our Galactic Domination series with a look at strip mining the galaxy, and the week after that if we should be going to Mars or the Moon first. If you want to know us when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you'd like to help support future episodes you can donate to us on Patreon or on our website IsaacArthur.net, which I'll link to in the episode description below along with all of our various social media forums where you can get updates and chat with others about the concepts in the episodes and many other futuristic ideas. You can also follow us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Spotify to get our audio-only versions of the show. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week.